It's Tuesday, September 8th. I'm Scott. I'm Rim. And this is Geek Nights. PAX 2009. In your face. Let's do this. And we are back from PAX 2009. It was it was like the best PAX ever. Uh, why are you why are you spoiling it like that? <laughs> Spoilers, yeah, <laughs> Spoilers. sorry guys. <laughs> I mean we we went to PAX last year and we were like, oh my gosh, the best COD in the universe. And I I was going again this year and I'm like, well, I wonder, was it actually the best COD in the universe? I mean, was Otacon. I just like real excited? Was I hallucinating? Are they, you know, was it a one-time deal? Is it going to be that good again? I mean, I remember, you know, our first Otakon, and we were, like, amazed by it. And as time went on, we got more and more jaded. And also, you know, only the two of us went last year. So the rest of the crew basically had to listen to us every day for the next six months talk about how great PAX was. No, every other con sucks. To the point that I don't think anyone believed any anything we said. I began to not believe myself, much like when I watched Evangelion, then didn't watch it for many years, and then watched it again. PAX is the same way, and of course, the same exact result. I watch it again the second time, and I say, what the fuck was I thinking? This is better than I even thought it was the first time. <laughs> I, it was such a great convention, and it was, it was better than last year. Part, I mean, the mystique was gone, but at the same time, what replaced it was the, the foreknowledge and the ability to plan. and Like, I knew what to expect. Mm-hmm. Yep, that helped a lot. Plus, I played a lot more games this year. That's definitely, you know, that's one thing. It's a gaming convention. Play fucking games. It's, you know, I mean, like, last year I didn't play nearly enough games. But you know what? Some of the most fun times at a gaming convention are just playing games. So anytime I didn't have something, I freaking just, bam, playing games. But and first, before we continue into the full review of PAX, and hopefully we'll be able to get through all of this tonight without having to extend into Thursday, but we'll just make a real long one. Welcome, all of you new listeners, to Geek Nights. It's a I hope you exist. There are four different nights of Geek Nights, so this is Tuesday night, you know, gaming. I apologize to our regular listeners that we're doing another Tuesday show too soon. We should have been doing a Monday show, but we were still in Seattle. I think it'll make a much better PAX show because we are doing it so quickly after the PAX, we won't forget everything. And I have a bunch of notes here, too. So. But you can all relax. Unlike last year, we will not do three hour and a half long shows about PAX. No, we'll just do this show and that's it. Though that might let you in on how excited we were after last PAX, but... You know the story of PAX. We wanted to go since the first PAX, since we heard there this is, might this be. This is only, I think, PAX number six or seven, so we haven't, we haven't missed too many. We of could them. have gone to all of them. We just didn't want it enough. We we'll go on all the PAX Easts, and hopefully they won't be bad. Oh, my God. But we came back. We went back to PAX, and it was the best thing ever. So, new listeners, gaming is just one quarter of what we do. So, Mondays are science and tech, and Wednesdays are anime and manga and comics and all that stuff, and... Thursdays are things that sometimes get us in trouble and weird stuff. Yeah. And, yeah. and although this will be the last, this will be the only PAX episode, I can see in the future, the near future at least, all the Tuesday episodes are probably going to be PAX-related things. We've probably planned the next two months' worth of Tuesday episodes. Yeah, or like more like next year's worth of Tuesday <laughs> episodes, and then another PAX will happen. Or at least next six months, and then it'll be PAX East, and that'll give us the next six months, and so on, so on and so forth. So blah, 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 if you're new, join the forums, they're great, yada, yada, whatever. Uh, that aside, before we get into PAX, I want to say this, and we say this all the time, and everyone at PAX says this, but uh, the enforcers, you guys made that con happen. And, like, it's not just, you know, we're saying this. Individual enforcers, very specifically and directly, made our personal PAX better for being cool and helping us out more than once. Yep, I want to, let's see, which, which enforcer is totally awesome? All the enforcers managing the Raven Theater. Ah, the Raven Theater. All the enforcers in the Wolfman Theater. Equally awesome. I'm still, I'm so sad that we stole, the, <laughs> we'll tell that when we get to it. All the enforcers at the Bring Your Own Computer area. Oh my god, uh, all, all right, enforcer the, dudes, I forgot all your names, but I gave you business cards if you were cool. All Email the enforcers me. who handled the main events. All the enforcers who were giving out the badges. Seriously, the enforcers at PAX uh. are like a breed above and beyond the staff of any other convention. It is telling that more than one PAX enforcer said had a disparaging comment to make about SakuraCon, the local anime con out there. And they basically express everything that we always say, that anime cons have terrible staff and PAX has solved the how do you have good staff problem. All the enforcers at the tabletop check-in, check-out. 
All the enforcers at the Retro Gaming. <laughs> all the enforcers in the DS Lounge. Uh, all the other enforcers, I didn't really hang out with you. Anyone in a Utilikilt? <laughs> Any, all the enforcers are in Utilikilts. Um... Okay. What what says it best is that at the very end, when Gabe and Tycho come out for the Omegathon finale and they thank all the enforcers, he doesn't just say, you know, thank you, enforcers. He says basically, thanks to all the people who are dedicated enough to take on the black this year. Yeah. That is the level (laughs) that the PAX Enforcer is at. One pack, you know, it's kind of like the old saying one riot, one Texas Ranger. Mm. One PAX Enforcer is worth like 20 Otakon Gophers and at least like five or six Otakon staff. Sorry, Otakon, but seriously. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, so let's uh, do our chronology so we don't forget things. Let's jump right in. Now, we got on a train. It was a train in New York. Well, we, we basically we had to drive to Scott's, to uh, Emily's and Alex's apartment. And walk then walk to the train. To the train station. So car, feet. Took the train to New York, train, car feet, train. And we had to take a bus. Bus to the airport, car feet, train, bus. Then a plane. Car feet, train, bus, plane. Then a taxi. Taxi. And then we were at PAX. And because we (laughs) stayed at the uh, Sheraton, we were basically like 100 feet away from PAX. It was pretty much the closest possible hotel, which is awesome. Not as good of a hotel as the Red Lion, though. I'm going back to the Red Lion. Yeah, the Red Lion's only a block farther away, and it's better. It was just so much better. Yeah. Though the closeness was really, really nice. Yeah, I was always kind of surprised. I'd stagger out of PAX at like 3 a.m. and, you know, uh, and suddenly I'm already like in my hotel. Yeah, I'm definitely getting the Hilton for Otakon because it's just so worth it. Like, you don't even realize how far the Renaissance is until you've been closer. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, uh, let's see what. Oh, JetBlue, right. JetBlue's new terminal at JFK is totally awesome. It has a Muji store. If you're flying somewhere, go JetBlue at JFK if We're possible. We're not chills for JetBlue. Scott is just a JetBlue fanboy. You see that terminal? You seen a terminal like that? It in your was a life? nice terminal. However, <laughs> it helped us out because you know one trouble I always have at conventions is not remembering to carry business cards around, and when people give me business cards, I lose them. <laughs> so in the Muji store, of all things, we're looking, and Scott says, "Hey, business card holders." Well, I was I, I was just in the store looking around, and then it came to my mind a business card holder would probably be something this store has, and it's something I need. And they had a selection of three. Well, here's the thing. Scott was looking. He's like, check this out. We should get it. And I point out that no, the one you're looking at is inferior because the one I'm holding has two separate sections. Well, I had seen that one already and I had dismissed it because it was ludicrously expensive compared to the other one. And I'm like, who the fuck needs two slots? Ah, I'll two just- slots. The magic is that one slot is for your business cards and the other is for everyone else's business cards. And once I realized this key piece of information, we purchased the double slot business card holders from the Muji store. Of course, I've got these stack of business cards in front of me. I have to email everyone that I talk to at the con. All right. So moving on very quickly because we don't have a lot of time. Let's get, we got to get right up to the pack stuff. So- uh, well, I mean, N-Guy Kroll was on our airplane. We didn't talk to him, though, until later. Yep. Not that much later. I mean, Friday morning. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, but yeah, I was like, is that N-Guy Kroll? And then, yes, it was. But I don't really have much to say to him because I, all I know is that he's a famous game reviewer, but I don't really read his reviews or know anything I'll about him. I'll be honest. Him. All I know about him is that David Riley is a fanboy for him. Yeah. He is almost gar for him. It's, it's kind of funny. Yeah, I mean, if, uh, say, Yahtzee, who wasn't there, or uh, James Rolfe was there, I would have had something to say to them. But I didn't have anything to say to N Guy Kroll. So. All right. <laughs> so anyway, we got our badges Thursday. So one cool thing this year, they kind of they pushed the badge pickup over to the Grand Hyatt. They had this whole separate like function area set up. One little room over there was taken up by this LSU thing that we'll talk about later. That was. <laughs> oh yeah, basically it's the start of college football season. Or we'll talk about it right now. Okay. So Louisiana State University people were all over Seattle because. Their first game was an away game against, I guess, WSU or whatever I will say one thing. over there. Anyone who thinks gamers are immature, those LSU people were a thousand times more annoying and than so anyone basically from the PAX. whole city of Seattle was occupied by Paxers and LSU people. Yes, but I know Pax people did not at restaurants while everyone's trying to eat start shouting slogans as loud as they can and banging on the tables. Yeah, you only do that at the game, guys. Keep you know, at the game, totally awesome. At the at the dinner, at the restaurant. Not totally awesome. Now, the great thing is, and I, this is still my Carthago Delendum est for all of the stupid anime conventions that don't do this. Pax mails out the badges. So we literally showed up, and Emily had to pick up her badge. She didn't pre-reg in time to get it mailed to her. So we walk in, and the enforcer, who knows what's up, is like, all right, you go that way, and oh, you guys, special, go this way. So we walk two different ways. We both end up in the same room. The same empty room, except for some enforcers. <laughs> There are more enforcers in that room than there were people needing badges. Yep. 
And then we just got our badges immediately because it was no line because everyone got the mail to them. You know, it's so great. You know, I go to PAX and it's like, yeah, I am Rim from Geek Nights. And they're like, shall I warm sir's crack pipe? Here's sir's badge. Warmed. <laughs> I go to Otakon and I'm like, who are you again? Uh, we lost your thing. Go to this other line. Exactly. <laughs> right. So we got our badges. It was a wonderful experience getting our badges. Then uh, we went and did the, because last year me and Rim spent the whole Labor Day in Seattle. So we did all the Seattle touristy stuff like the Space Needle. But we weren't staying Monday this year. And Emily and Alex were there who had never been to Seattle. So we quickly, after getting our badges, did a whole bunch of Seattle touristy stuff. Such as seeing the chocolate pasta down at the market and eating some buns at the Chinese bakery. Oh my God, that sticky rice! Yeah, that was great. Tell about the sticky rice. It was it was this magical. I just had a normal bean bun. It was a bean it was bun. this mystical sticky rice. It looked like just sticky rice, so I got it. But as I'm eating it, I come across a little pocket of chicken curry, a little pocket of sausage, a little pocket of squash. It, it was beautiful. It was a thing if I would have known that that I see, I didn't notice the sticky rice. I had already bought my bean bun. I was too slow. I could have gotten that sticky rice. Oh, missed out. That I was missed a, out. that was one of the better <laughs> sticky rices I have eaten. All right. So the one, the only real thing I have to point out is that one, they knew they were going to sell out. They had gigantic pre-made banners saying, "We are out of badges. Do not even try." Yep. <laughs> With a little sad. They face had on signs them. all over the convention center: "No badges. No badges." Uh, anyway, all right, so... We, we, we also, we hung out with, you know, our PAX friends. We have the Azen Posse and the West Coast crew, but the head of that is basically Ro and Jeremy, who are two awesome listeners and friends that... Uh, they're there, as far as I'm concerned, they have, they're now at the top of the listener chart. They're number one listeners. I gotta give a shout-out to Ro, largely because she made these Geek Nights buttons and went around doing the PAX Forum button ear thing. Oh, yeah, there's a button ear thing, basically. You know, at Oticon, like, if you make buttons, you'll sell them in Artist Alley. Well, at PAX, everyone makes buttons, or at least a lot of people do. And then you basically trade buttons with everyone else who's also a button person. So it's like, hey, I've got a 1,000 buttons that are mine that identify me, and then you got buttons, so I'll trade with you, and I'll trade... And then hopefully if everyone makes the same number and everyone has one for everyone, everyone will end up with the same button set at the end. Well, except that a lot of industry people make buttons too and they'll have limited... Like one guy was like, I got 700, come and get them. Yeah, we got the Ninja Turtles buttons. We were so cool. Anyway. Oh, uh, yeah. All right. So, uh, okay. So we went to bed uh, Thursday. And we one thing I'll note, uh, you know, we, we hung around. We went through this GameStop because I had not pre-ordered Layton and I needed something to do in the downtime. And there is nothing sadder than seeing the people who work at the GameStop next to PAX who have to work at the GameStop during PAX. I know, right? What kind I'm of I'm sure life they is didn't that? have to work for the entirety of PAX, you know, because they only have to work eight hours and PAX goes late, so they could have gone to concerts, but still. I got a hint. That if, sucks ass. If you work at GameStop and you live near PAX, make call your sick day in for next year now. So, but everyone else already called the sick day in. You don't know the dates yet, I don't think. <laughs> as soon as they announce the dates, be like, just those are the dates you quit the GameStop. <laughs> anyway, uh, oh, oh, uh, we ate dinner. That was totally awesome at this. Uh, basically, it was a buffet and it was expensive. It was like $25 all you can eat, but it was all you could eat sushis and awesomeness. So Scott Johnson's dad would have been very happy with infinite crab. There was this one PAX guy. He was definitely a PAX guy. And he walks up and he literally just fills a plate over a foot high with crab legs. <laughs> and then he goes back to his table. You eat crab? I eat three. All right, enough <laughs> about us and our personal BS before PAX. We're talking about PAX. So Friday morning, we had, you know, we're speakers, and this year, speakers got a special privilege. We got to walk into the expo room an hour and a half before the mobs got in. That, that alone practically made my PAX, because I was able to do everything I wanted to do except play Left 4 Dead or StarCraft 2, because they're it, despite the early entry and the small number of people... There were lines for both of those that I was not willing to I couldn't to play in. Diablo 3, StarCraft 2, or Left 4 Dead 2 because it was basically early entry for media people and speakers. So we got into this room. We had 90 minutes to see this room. And all the media people were doing all that, and we couldn't. So, and not that I, you know, the thing is, any of those games, I'm probably, you know, either not, either going to buy, like Left 4 Dead 2, no matter what, or... Probably not gonna, like the Blizzard games, so... Well, what amazed me was that for so few people in the room, I would have had to wait like 15 minutes to play Left 4 Dead. I know. Actually, I was considering buying Diablo 3, even though it's a click fest. I don't know why, though. Why? I don't I can, know. I can click faster than you. I just wanted to check it out. Anyway. <laughs> the uh, So, pretty. yeah, we saw... 
a ton of awesome shit in this room. First off, uh, you know the, the biggest thing that stood out was the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles turtle van. The, it is it like a actual perfect... actual Ninja Turtles turtle van. And it actually drives. They drove it there. Yep, we talked to the guys who were running it. They couldn't answer many questions, and we seemed to ask all these weird questions that caught them off guard, but they're like, uh, yeah, it drives, I guess. We drove it here. <laughs> yeah, it was full of all sorts of Ninja Turtles. You know, uh, mer uh, memorabilia and merchandise. They and had things. like a sign cell and like all the original toys, some old like pewter miniatures of the turtles. Yeah. I don't know if those were direct or bootleg or what. But no, were... I think those are front for like they were video game. They were a uh, uh, tabletop miniature related, weren't they? they well, were they were. They were like Reaper minis, right? They were, but they I, they didn't. Ha I wasn't sure. It looks like they may or may not have been at least initially fully licensed because they were kind of blob you couldn't even really tell what they were well they were knew. just poorly made and back then you know they were based off of the comic book art and such and anyway yeah awesome ninja turtles action going on over in the ninja turtles van i think they were promoting a ninja turtles game i don't even know uh yeah All I know they were. Is ninja turtles were awesome and that they had a van <laughs> But behind that, you know, walking further in, what stood out more than anything, and we talked to this guy, we used up like half of our time in this early, like, checkout, just talking to this guy. There's this company, Geek Chic, and they basically make heirloom gamer Not chic, furniture. like with a, you know, with a, with a camel, the other kind of chic. Yes. Yes. They make heirloom quality geek furniture. Like you're a gamer. They make like an eleven thousand dollar custom like oh, actually, amazing. They have tables a lot cheaper than eleven thousand dollars. Uh yeah, I didn't say they didn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> but they like they make these amazing custom for you gamer tables. Like basically you talk to them and you say things like, you know, I am this kind of gamer. These are the things I would like a table to be able to do to accommodate my gaming. And they'll make it for you. And this is some high quality stuff. They're not carpenters. They're cabinet makers. Yeah, I learned that. That was a very good. Thing. I learned a lot of stuff from these guys. But, uh, you know, the best thing about this, right? How many times do you go online and you see like someone made a gaming table and it's got secret message compartments or it's got little drawers to, or it's got a little place for like the DM to put his screen or it's got like a piece of plastic. You can move the minis around, you know, and put the maps under it. Basically, these, these guys, they had it all. And it's basically, for reals, get your gaming table, not some shoddy thing made by you in your, you know, garage. And the prices are very reasonable, and the, the from what I could tell, the amount of service they provide and the quality level were extremely high. And, like, they had a table you could get for, like, less than $2,000. It was crazy. And, like, goddamn, a dining room table usually costs more than that. So to have a dining room table that is more than just a table costs about the same as a dining room table? Fuck yeah. Well, you got to check out the pictures I uploaded. One, this guy was really dapper. Robert Gifford, the guy, the, the, his title that he gave himself for the company is Instigator. Nah, excellent. But Robert Gifford was very dapperly dressed, and he gave a, like, the, it wasn't really a sales pitch because we were just talking to him, and we're, we're going to interview him soonish. Yeah, so. so we won't go too long about, but these tables, fucking amazing, gonna get one as soon as I have a place to put one. I just, I have so, such a vision of the table I want, and I'm willing to pay almost anything for it. I mean, that, like, the glass over it, like underneath, you can have it's the a, white you, board. Oh, you, so you got these eat li leaves, right? So it's a dining room table. If you flip the leaves over, it's felt surface. So it's like, ah, you can play some nice games on there. If you remove the leaves, now you have a pit. At the bottom of the pit is a whiteboard. Then if you don't want to use the whiteboard, you can put some pieces of paper maps over the whiteboard and then a piece of plastic on top of that to hold the maps down and play like Battletech or your Warhammer or whatever. The Sultan, all the tables have cool names, but the Sultan line of the tables. The Sultan is basically the maximum table. They had like this system where every, every spot where a player would sit, you can fold down the top to your own personal little cubicle, basically. So you have like a screen built in. And you have like three card filing drawers and and the game master setup like there the are game dice master. pits with like rubber bumpers in them it's not a gm screen it's like a gm module that slides out and opens up these yeah. tables were so cool the only thing is with these tables basically i kind of actually it'd be great if we got the table because it would force us to play rpgs that had five or fewer players in a gm you the, couldn't the, play a bigger game with it yeah you can the maximum sultan they had listed was a seven player plus gm table seven players yeah. we have still have more than that though Anyway. Well, for our one game. Right, exactly. All right, so Geek Tables. Oh, so then over next to the Geek Tables, there's this company Steel Series with mice and keyboards and that sort of stuff. And I was like, you know, usually you'd look at those companies like Razer or whatever who make like the gaming peripherals and you're like, oh, whatever. You know, that's kind of silly. I mean, last year, remember the gun mouse that some company had? The thing is, all these things are usually cool but not worth the money. 
Exactly. Like that gun miles was surprising. Like we thought it was stupid. We scoffed at it. But then I tried it, played some Counter Strike, and hey, this is actually pretty good. Yeah. So I went. So you checked out what Steel Series had, just sort of while I was standing there. And actually, what they had was pretty great. I mean, they had this mouse called, I think it was the, the uh, I forget the name of it. The, Regardless, what yeah. Scott pointed out is that this mouse was designed with me in mind. Because Scott doesn't care as much about this sort of thing, but I am like, su- like I'm so picky about my mouse, and I will diddle with the tiniest adjustments to the sensitivity. This mouse... You save the sensitivity settings in the mouse. You can also, like, set, like, different key bindings in the mouse. You can make, there's buttons on the side. You could set, like, the button on the side to be semicolon or three or whatever. Just all the settings are in the mouse itself. So you don't need any special drivers or software to set the mouse up. You just spin, there's an LCD screen on the bottom of the mouse, and you can spin the mouse wheel and push the buttons on the mouse to change the settings. It's totally crazy. Dude, he showed me you can change the sensitivity down to a single inch individual cpi yep. it was i gotta get plus and then you can set the polling rate exactly equal to your vertical refresh of your monitor oh that that's a really good idea. 70 like you got a 75 hertz monitor 75 hertz mouse plus the coolest thing you know it doesn't have a hump it's a normal sized and shaped yeah mouse. it's like a lot of the gaming mice like especially the razor ones they look all weird this mouse is just a totally normal looking mouse the thing i like most about it you know is i mean those settings were cool but i don't really need them well, first of all, the mouse is reasonably priced, like only 90 bucks, I think, right? Was that the mouse was just so smooth on the mouse pad. Like, the, the, the level of friction was just, oh, so luxurious. I think I might buy the mouse pad. Even though the mouse pad was and is a ludicrous $35 for that particular mouse pad, that's something I'm going to use every single day of my life for a long, long period of time. I think it's worth the $35 for that good feeling in my hands. Much in the same vein as the Aeron chairs we bought. It's just, I got to have a something like chair. that. Well, I got an error. Because I value freedom. I value air. <laughs> anyway, uh, what so, else was awesome in there? I forget what game they were promoting. It, sadly, their promotion must not have worked that well. I didn't pay attention to what it was. There was this gigantic, and I mean gigantic. Oh, yeah, that was just some sort of like action RPG, walk around, hit things with a sword game. Pneumatic horse. And supposedly the guy who was running it and who made it was like he did this for Jurassic Park. Yeah, he was one of those animatronic types. And this thing, like, I've been on, like, bar, you know, stay on the rocking bull before. This was that times a thousand. And basically, I'm looking at it, and I was like, can I ride it? And he's like, that guy's about to ride it. Just sign this waiver. And the waiver was basically... The waiver was like, uh, riding mechanical horses is an extreme sport. You may die. You will die. Of course, the thing was surrounded by, like, inflatable, you know, big, like, bag. That was... The thing is, it's funny because you couldn't even, like, you had to be pretty skilled even to get on that thing because there's no, like, stirrup. A fat guy went before him and had trouble getting on. Yep, but when I got there, I basically had to, like, jump and then bounce and then, like, haul myself up, but... I would have gotten on from the back, cowboy style. I held on for 30 seconds. I'm very proud of myself. The guy who got two guys before you was, like, a pro. He stayed on for a long time. Yep, the thing is, this thing, it threw me off with an amount of force that was unexpected, shall we (laughs) say. So I, I get thrown off. I'm laying there. I throw off the horns, like, yeah! And then the guy controlling it... Has the horse look at me because I'm still laying there. It was like a demonic horse, too, with like glowing eyes. And they had like a smoke machine. So smoke was coming out from under it. You know, it was a horse from hell. Right. And the horse comes and looks at me and the crowd's like, oh, and I look up and I see the horse looking at me. And then a second later, right in the mean bean machine. Yeah. Imagine it's like imagine the mechanical bull strikes back like you're like you already threw you off and now it headbutts you. I was good. <laughs> I, the thing is, I was stupid. I just stopped playing the video as soon as rim fell off. So I didn't catch that part. I gotta learn from now on, whenever I video something, video over. That's my lesson I learned. So speaking of that, things of the day. My thing of the day is the video Scott took of me riding the horse. I'm still sad you didn't get the shot of the horse getting me in the Mean Bean Machine. Yeah. My, uh, I hope this, I haven't uploaded the video yet, so this might be a, a fail thing of the day. We'll see. I'm pretty sure it'll work, though. I'll just Worst wait. case, we'll get it up, like, tomorrow. Yeah, I'll, I'll get it up. Don't worry. Uh, my thing today is something I'll talk about later in this episode. Basically, there was some awesome case modding action, and the be- the winner, the best case modder, was this guy from NFC Systems. So his website is my thing of the day. That was pretty cool. Oh, yeah. All uh, right, so back to the Expo Hall. I played... 
uh, Miles Edgeworth investigations for like 30 seconds. You basically hit the stylus against the screen a couple times and walked away. Yeah, I just checked and to see what kind of thing it was. And it, it was freaking Edgeworth investigations. I didn't, you know, I'm going to play it for reals and buy it. So what do I need to play it there we for? We played Super Mario Brothers Wii, which was... About it was exactly what I expected. It was as fun as I expected. The con- the only complaint the I had the controls are a little not smooth. The control more and more Nintendo like all the Mario games. The controls are a little more loose than you know. They basically, I want s- the controls to be tight like Mario Three or Mario. That's 4. what I was about to say. Yeah. Ever since Mario Three, every game after that has been slightly more loose. Yep. Mario Three was perhaps the most precisely controlled Mario game ever made, and then Mario Super Mario World was only slightly less precisely controlled. This game was real loose, but otherwise, it's super fun. We're just gonna buy it. I don't yeah. need to review it any further than that. It's exactly what it looks like. Uh, Tatsunoko vs. Capcom. I looked at it. It was Tatsunoko vs. Capcom. Yep. Uh, we saw Suro, that game we talked about. Oh, way we back. did an episode about Suro, and we said it was out of print. It's back in print. It's a company picked print. it up, so you can just go buy it. They had a whole thing, a display about it. I don't think, it, I don't think you can buy it yet. They were selling it there, but they said the release date was coming soon ish. I think they, I don't know if they were selling overstock from before or if they're selling reprints or what, but yeah. it's back. Did we have the business card? I forget what the company was. I feel bad. I got it laying in my pile. I've only gone through the pile of people that I have to email back in a timely manner. Yeah, we'll make, uh, in the, the we'll put a bunch of show notes for this episode, basically. Basically. Scott uh, played uh, Forza 3, and then I played Forza 3. With was the, that actually Forza 3? I'm not sure which Forza it was. Pretty sure it was 3. With the it had three, three screens and a steering wheel and a surround sound and a seat and pedals and the whole thing. It was basically the maximum setup for that game, which it's cool. You know, we talked to the guy who was running the thing. He basically pointed out with the Forza series, they have this feature that if you're hardcore and you have three Xboxes, three copies of the game, and three screens, you can do this three screen thing. But... They basically, it's not designed to sell the game. He admitted that no one buys that game because it has it. They only do it as a gift to the fans of their series of racing games. Mm. Because they know that a lot of their fans will go hardcore and make like rigs with three Xboxes in them. The thing is, I played it with the three screens. I realized after getting off and watching Rim play that I never looked at the left or right screen ever. Right? And two, there was a rear view mirror on the right screen that I never looked at. (laughs) But once I looked at it while Rim was playing, it was a damn good looking rear view mirror. Let me tell you. But yeah, uh, four is a three. If you like realistic racing games, that seems like a winner to me. Oh, but so I'm not a big fan of them so much. At the I'm Activision more like the booth, arcade racers. At the Activision booth, and I'm pretty sure I didn't see anyone talking about them remaking these. This might be one of the originals from back in the day. That wasn't the Activision booth. It was the retro merch booth. I, it, to me, in my life, it's the Activision booth. Okay. Because they had among the Atari 5200s and Commodores for sale. The Activision Bucket Brigade patch. The one that if you took a picture of your screen with a high enough score from Kaboom on the Atari and mailed it to them, they would send you this badge. Yep, but yeah, there's a booth that's all that was at PAX last year and this year that sells all sorts of wicked retro shit, like holy shit retro stuff. And it's for sale. It's not like, yeah, we're just a little museum. It's like, holy shit, they're selling this crap. And they got a lot of it. So I try not to spend too much time at that booth because I could be there all fucking day. But uh, it's always good to just stop by it real quick, see like a few amazing things. That way it'll be, that booth will be amazing year after year after year. Because I doubt they're going to get more retro shit, right? <laughs> they sort of have all of it already. We pretty much wandered around everything else. In oh, the we Xbox played, uh, there's an R Type co op that's coming to the uh, Xbox. Uh, oh, arcade, I forgot about that. Right? Friggin', you can push a button to switch it from 3D mode to retro mode, graphics wise, like in- instantly, all, all you want. And it was our type, and it was co-op, and we, me and Rim played it, and we sucked ass, but we had infinite lives. Oh, that's the thing. It was hard as balls, but one of the co-op modes is how many lives does it take you, which is super fun. Yeah, much more fun than you die, play the first level a million times, never play level three, because you can't But at the same time, there. that's that's the best way to get better, is to be forced to play again. Yep. Uh, we played some of the PAX 10 games. Uh, Osmos was a one that I played the mo- I spent the I most time with. I think Osmos is my favorite I didn't play at the closure one. I wanted to play that. I didn't get to. But, yeah, we're going to have to play those on our own time and, uh, you know, then maybe do another episode on them or something. But uh, you can go online and fi- get the list of what the PAX 10 games were. Uh, they were all looking pretty good to me. Uh, let's see. Anything else going on? In the- oh, the glove. We didn't, oh, get, yeah, to, we this didn't company, get to use the glove. This company, Peregrine, had a glove. And people, there was a line to use it, and I just didn't I didn't have time. We spent all our time talking to the Geek Sheet guy and riding that horse. Yep. But I'm not sure what it was, but it looked like it was working pretty well, and people seemed to be digging it. But I have a feeling it's cool in the way that that gun mouse was cool. I don't know how applicable it is. So 
If anyone tried that out, let us know how it was. Yeah, basically what it looked like to me is you could, you, had, you put on this glove that was sort of had like, you know, a motion capture rig kind of stuff. You know, the same thing they use for that. And you would bind different gestures, physical hand gestures to different keys on the keyboard. Like they opened up, I saw during a demo someone was uh, doing, like they opened up Notepad and a guy was basically moving his fingers and all sorts of letters were appearing on the screen. So like you would go, you would take this and you would go into a game and you would like bind like index finger is shoot and middle finger is jump or, you know, whatever you are, wave your hand back and forth, you know. So I wonder how well it works. I didn't get to use it myself, but it existed. Uh, and I noticed no one was trying to sell stupid VR goggles. Yep. <laughs> we got to wait on it. Every year, there's some VR goggle that's better, but is, they're not at the point where they're great yet. Yep, and I, my guess would be that the glove is in the same sort of position. But we had a little bit of time before our first panel, so we wandered around. You know, We checked out like the console free play, the tabletop area. The console free play was completely empty. You know, a con had just started. It was the brand new you know, opening of the con. And the cool enforcers were doing the same kind of thing we used to do when we ran like the Katsukon gaming area. They were just setting up random challenges. Guy was like, if you can beat Quick Man's level and get to Quick Man, don't even have to beat Quick Man, you win. And Scott Without was, dying. Scott was unable to get to Quick Man. You know that I can do it, right? Of course, we stumped him when we pointed out, hey, can I go to Flashman's level first, beat him, and without, then... The thing is, you try to beat Flashman without dying, without any weapons. Well, what you do is you beat everyone in the order to get to Quick Man, and then you beat Quick Man's level right. with Flashman. Exactly. Actually, Flashman's pretty easy to beat with the uh, standard gun. Yeah, he is, but the problem is you gotta get to him and then beat him without dying. I mean, usually what'll happen if you try to beat Flashman right away is you can beat him right away, but you'll die at him and then beat him with your next life. So to do it without dying is something special, especially on difficult mode as opposed to, well, real regular mode as opposed to easy mode, right? But yeah, it was basically get to quick, man, which means the only real dangerous stuff is the lasers that instantly kill you. And you know I can do it. I'm the Mega Man 2 guy. But I didn't concentrate very much. We are chatting it up. I had to go to a panel. I took two tries at it. I got pretty close. I didn't make it. I probably could have done it if I went back later. But I, I could do it. I just don't want to. You want me to do it uh, after, uh, you know, uh, the show? I don't know. We'll save it. We'll, we'll, we'll do some event with Quick Man maybe in the I future. Could, I could definitely do it. There's no question about but it. But this was all just lead up, you know, extra time before, you know, our first panel, Beyond Candyland in the Raven Theater Friday morning. Raven Theater. So we got there early and the bonus round was there before us. And we actually, because the bonus round wanted to film some bonus round, in the con with their backdrop before you know they left the room they basically made our panel beyond candyland 15 minutes late yep that's all right because our panel was full and it was great it was an awesome panel i was so amazed when we get to the room and we see you know they're, they're like the room there are a lot of people in the in the bonus round thing but there are a lot of people lined up way early to see beyond candyland yeah i mean you know there wasn't much else going on at the con at the time and you know our panel was uh, had a good name people like board games i noticed that even though there was a lot of tabletop action going at the con a big watsy presence big tabletop area you know, all the tabletop tables are basically constantly full, the whole con. Uh, there wasn't that much tabletop panel action, you know, the, the, relatively speaking, to the amount of tabletop gaming that there was. So, you know, the fact that we were one of the few tabletop panels with Beyond Candyland, I think, topped us out. One cool thing, though, we finally, you know, N Guy Krull was on our plane. So we actually, we talked to him because he was on this panel and we're all hanging yeah, out he in the was, room. He was on the, uh, you know, the bonus round. So when the bonus round was leaving, we were like, hey, you N Guy Krull? Yeah, I saw you on the plane. Oh, what's up? Yeah. That was it. The funny thing was, though, they had, they, they, you know, quiet in the room. They filmed the, what, the, uh, the segment for bonus round with the backdrop of bonus round. And it took me back to us trying to do stage things as opposed to the kind of live geek nights we do. Where they do like 10 takes and you keep flubbing yeah, the guy had to do three takes, he flubbed it, you know, and it was like, oh, everyone does that. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Even the semi, this real professional guy flubs it. So we're all good. But the panel went crazy well. Like people freaking loved it. People and loved it so much. They, we, they came to our other panels because our first was so Yeah, it was awesome. great. You know, the first panel, you know, we're like, who here knows who we are? And like four people raised their hands. Our second panel on Saturday, who here came here because they saw our other panel and like half the room raised their hands. Yep. And beyond D&D, &D, as far as I can tell, was like 75% people who came because of our other panels and 25% people who missed Beyond D&D &D attacks last year. Yep. That's very good. <laughs> Oh, it was great. I mean, it would have been better, though, to have completely different people fill up the room three times because then we get the widest coverage. 
But then that also means our first panel sucked and no one wanted to come back. But so. I, will, I will call Beyond Candyland a huge success because for the entire rest of the con, like numerous times, like every time we're in a panel room, we or in a tabletop gaming room, sorry, we'd see people playing, like learning how to play like Settlers or Puerto Rico or t &E or Agricola or something. And almost every time, they were people who weren't really tabletop gamers who went to the panel and then, because of us, played one of the games we recommended at PAX. Yep. That made me so happy. In fact, during our Beyond Candyland, right, this guy from Joystick was in the audience. And oh, he, yeah, Kevin. Yeah. Kevin was pretty cool. And the saddest thing was he gave me the business card and we're like, hey, let's do something because Joystick's trying to do this, uh, this segment. Apparently, Joystick has some column that's like about tabletop games. So he's like, hey, I'll interview you for this column. We're like, okay, sure, whatever. And Kevin's pretty cool. The problem was he was busy and we were busy. And basically the entire rest of PAX was, hey, you want to do this thing? Ah, oh, no, I got to do this. Uh, hey, you ready now? Oh, no, I got to do this back and forth. And basically neither, we were never both free at the same time for the entirety of the con. That's all right. But basically he, uh, he bought Puerto Rico because we said it was so awesome. So that was, that was pretty cool. Yep. So we'll, we'll let you know what comes of that. We're going to try to do the phone interview maybe tomorrow, yeah. sometime this week. We also met up with him at dinner on Sunday, and he gave us a copy of Risk Halo Wars. We'll see about that. Risk Halo Wars, <laughs> it, the, you look at the box, and all I could think was this looks like a joke from a something awful Photoshop contest. Oh, my God. It's so true. But it isn't. It is so dead serious. It is an actual game. It, it's real. I have it. <laughs> We're going to play it. We're going to review it. We have to. So, you know, we the one the thing is, right, we scheduled our panels. We told them we don't want to miss any of the concerts. We don't want to miss the keynote. We don't want to miss the make a strip panel. We don't want to miss. Right. And so, Amber and everyone we worked with setting these panels up was super cool. And they basically were like, yeah, whatever you want. So, they so we had to run from beyond Candyland to the keynote. And we get to the keynote, and they're like, well, we can't promise you'll get in. And we're like, fuck. Uh, so <sighs> I have my speaker bat, and I'm planning, like, if I don't get in, I'm going to pull rank, something I never want to do at PAX. I'll do that like anime cons, but I would never want to be that guy who's like, do you know who I am? Let me in. Right. But I was preparing, like, what I was going to do to get into the keynote no matter what. So we get at the end of the line, and we're just like, uh... Uh, we're like, let's get in line anyway. What do we? What else are we gonna we're do? We're expecting the line to get cut off. The funny thing was, we met all these punk kids in line who saw like our panel and then had gone to the line. We had to do stuff before we went, and they were like, "Wow, you guys have to stand in line too." I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then a miracle came we're, down. We're, well, we're getting guy. scarily close to being let in. We're like, are we gonna make it? Are we gonna make it? Are we gonna get into this room? Oh my god. <laughs> And we got we into it. the room. Yes, it was a miracle. The thing is, the reason we got in the room is because they rotated the room 90 degrees. They didn't rotate the actual room. They rotated the chairs and they moved the stage to the other side of the room, which means, right, that they fit a ton more chairs in there, first of all. Plus, the room was horizontally vertical as opposed to horizontally horizontal. So as a result, in instead of having, you know, the wide... It was deep instead of wide. They had two screens up on the sides of the stage. And then they had two more screens. <laughs> it was like there were four screens hanging from the ceiling. It was insane. And while sitting near the front for pretty much everything we did was really cool, if you sat way in the back, you had this great spectacle of the stage in the middle and then these four screens splayed out in your peripheral vision. It was basically, it was awesome no matter where you were in the room. I could not imagine a better layout for a main event short of an actual auditorium. Ron Gilbert for the keynote gave an amazing keynote uh, up to yep. par with last year. Yeah, it's pretty much covered the same topic as last year too of, hey, we grew up doing all this old shit. I mean, last year, right, it was Ken Levine talking about, I grew up in Logan's Run comics. Eh. And this in this year, he's like, I grew up on programming for the Atari and an old TI calculator. Eh. Yep. Ron Gilbert, though, he get, uh, these the two keynotes I've seen at PAX's are just so inspirational. Every year, by the end, I'm sitting there thinking, man, this is it. This is what I want to do. This is why we're here. And I'm just, like, super inspired. And I want to, like, make stuff. And just, like, it drives me crazy every year. Yep. Immediately following the keynote, there was some hustling. And uh, Gabe and Tycho came out for their Q's and A's. It wasn't as epic for us as last year because, you know, last year we went up and we asked a pretty epic question. And I remember we were like, I'm Rim, I'm Scott. And then Jerry's like, wow, it's like you guys have a show. And we're like, well, we do. <laughs> this year, I was, I was like, let's ask a question. Scott totally wussed out, so I had to go well, by myself. I was like, what are we going to ask? You got nothing. 
I had an okay question. You had nothing. I had a good question. I asked him, you know. I guess your question was good relative to some of the other questions, well, but it I wasn't thought, a what good, I want, it wasn't like a yeah, fuck yeah question. Well, what I wanted to know was about, because I found out they got someone to do art for the panel rooms this year. Because remember, you know, Jerry kind of randomly was like, let's name them. And name the panel rooms the Wolfman Theater, the, the Raven Theater, the Unicorn Theater. So Serpent is the big one. The yep. Big one. This year they had little crests on every panel room. Very cool. For its theme. So I was wondering if I, I could find out what they were going to name the PAX East rooms, and they haven't even thought about that yet. <laughs> Hopefully, I can name them. I'll name them the Dragon Theater. No, I, yeah, I would the go with Chimera a, Theater. I would go with a completely different theme, like something way out there and like completely off the wall from the ones before. No, I would continue with the Magical Beasts. No, I would go, I would like name them all adjectives. Uh, like, I'd make like the, no, I'd like the burning theater, the intense theater, the angry theater, something crazy. That's okay. Like that. It's okay, but I would still go with the magical beasts. But why? You already made that. You, are, you, you have four more magical beasts. As you opposed never have to having magical beasts, a completely separate theme that is just so separate. All aquatic beasts. <laughs> <laughs> so what? The Abeleth? Yeah, that's oh, a good one. That's the best name for a theater yet. The Boulet. Wait, maybe, <laughs> maybe you combine them. Because how do you name an inn in any Dungeons & Dragons game? The adjectiving verb, or the adverb. verb? The adjective verb? animal. Anything like that. Adjective animal theaters. So a grunting boar, rusting codpiece. <laughs> rusting codpiece. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, man, what if you actually themed up? Like, you actually, like, decorated them, like, inns and taverns? You know, PAX could do that because of their philosophy of having, like, you know... Anime cons have like the one staff. You know, you can make one like a tavern, one like a space cantina, like a Star Wars. Actually, there was a Star Wars cantina. It was like a LucasArts sponsored room that was just a big. It was very well put together, and you could get. It was just a big Star Wars promotion. It was very well put together. They had good music playing, and you could get a Sith smoothie for a couple bucks. Yeah, (laughs) I did not get a Sith smoothie. (laughs) They were also taking green screen pictures of people who were in costume. They were actually pretty good looking. Yeah, so none of the Q and A questions were particularly. Amazing, like oh man, epic lols. At least the thing is, we left uh, early. We didn't hang around. For well, because it thing. went on way too long. Yeah, they really should uh, limit the uh, Q and A lines or something. I don't know what they should do. No, nah, because it's really enjoyable. I just it went on. It was on, okay. It, it only just went wasn't on as good as last year. It only went on way too long because I was hungry. Yeah, I was also very. <laughs> Had hungry. I not been hungry, it would not have been too long. Yep. Of oh, course, the other trouble is that. They, it's great that it's democratic, but it's tough to screen. People are going to ask a good question versus people are going to be really annoying. Yeah. It is very relative to the questions you would get at, say, an anime convention. The questions were pretty damn good. The thing is, they just none of them were like, oh, my God, amazing questions, you know? And at most of it is, like, not even questions. It's just people coming up and telling their story. Like, you know, I came here from all the way across the country. Oh, man. I'm selling the cookies. Cookie Brigade. Oh, man. And, you know, those things. It's basically everyone make your packs announcements is what it really is. The guys who their friend couldn't make it, so they made a cardboard standee of him. Those guys were him, awesome. And then they, Dave and Tycho let the standee come up on stage and they took a picture with it. I saw that standee all around the con. Like playing games, hanging out with people. I feel bad for the guy who was in the picture of the Sandy who didn't get to come. See, now what I would do if I were them is I would have made a Sandy, a fake one, or maybe one of myself, and just use it as an excuse to get to do all this stuff on the illusion that I'm doing it for my friend who couldn't make it. Exactly. Because that Sandy was like a free pass to do anything cool you wanted to do at that con. Yep. Next year, sadly, I expect to see like 100 Sandys. Mm-hmm. So there was a panel on uh, Friday night. Was it Friday night? Yes, it was Friday night. Yep, the Winning Sucks panel. It was so weird because we looked at the schedule before PAX and we put a panel in Losing Should Be Fun. And we see on the schedule a panel Winning Sucks. Well, no, it was Designing for Failure. Why Winning Sucks? And, and it was like, done by Jason Booth, who's the senior technical designer at BioWare. Right. So like we're a look- big guns kind of guy. So we look at this, right? Before looking at who, what the name was of the person, we're like, did they rename our panel? We're like, no, they just put two panels with the same idea. What? Whoa. Thing is, there's nothing. One, there are a ton of panels that basically cover the same topic at PAX. I know. I know. But so we're like, whoa. So, of course, we had to check out this other panel that did the same exact thing we did. Yep. And it was pretty good. The guy definitely took a more. Yeah, a lot of good information, but he what, he uh, he just sort of spoke monotonely, you know, and read his, uh, sp- you know, stuff that he had to say. Well, even from that. But he- then when he was doing the Q&A, he got a lot more dynamic. He took a very textbook approach to it, and he talked a lot. He basically covered in a half hour uh, the, like, the kinds of topics that if you're already working with games at all, you already know all this. Yep. 
But it was, you know, it's the kind of stuff that someone with his job has to think about, you know? Like, you know, you go to a company you know, and you're making a video game and you're going to say, yeah, look, we're going to make it so that, you know, if you get shot, the player lays on the ground and can't do anything. And, you know, you have to sell that to the person you're making this game for. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, do we really want to let you make a game like that? You know? <laughs> So it was it was pretty interesting stuff going on. So along his lines, I think it reminded me back to the keynote of the whole theme that look at the people who did the keynotes and a lot of the people who are the big developers at these games now, these game studios and making games. They're by and large people who like tinkered and had programming skill and like were forced to push themselves and create early on. And I don't know what I, I see this trend where they're like now there's so many people who want to work in video games, but a lot of these people do not have computer skills. Like, they're not hacking nerds. They're just gamers. They're people who play games who want to make games. It's almost the exact same thing that happened to anime after the first couple of generations of anime directors. Yep. It's definitely all interesting. Also, I noticed in the keynote and at some of the other panels and such, there was, like, people were really, really, like, they, a lot of these game professional people just couldn't get over the fact that Roger Ebert says he doesn't think games are art. And, like, they just kept bitching about it. And obviously everyone disagreed with it. And obviously Roger e. Ebert is wrong, though he may be right about many other things. And his columns are usually very entertaining if you read them online. But uh, it's like the game, like, professional people just, like, couldn't get over that. And they mentioned it, like, at a bunch of panels. And I thought that that was interesting because he said it so long ago. And they're still, like, you know, killing these people that this dude said this. It's like, come on, get over it. Anyway. I was still, like Scott pointed out, kind of sad that almost all the panels were either like meta panels about game journalism or like meetups and things like that or they were primarily about the video game industry and almost nothing about any other like other than us there was almost nothing about any other kind of game yeah, there was a gm a, a game uh, a gm panel well that was art of the dungeon master well aka the art of being the eye in a world of warcraft raid <laughs> yeah <laughs> um you know there were a lot of panels that were like you know hey you know uh you know this group you know like we do this show here's our panel we do this show here's our panel there was also the i got laid off now now what panel? <laughs> that, that was uh, Alex went said he went to this panel uh, that was a uh, strategic game design. But actually, what it, he said what it was about was the guy had actually had all these really really interesting statistics about like you know games that have a trailer sell this much, games with a demo sell this much, game with a trailer and a demo sell this much, it, that, games with no trailer and no demo sell this much. Now this, the, that data was fascinating. It was also horrifying because the games that sell the most are the ones with a good trailer and no demo. If you have a demo, your, your game's probably not going to sell yeah, that Because a lot well. of people get all they want from your game out of the demo and they never need to play your game anymore. Well, think about it. If you make a game that is a novel concept, like it has a concept and that is what is selling the game, like it does this new mechanic or something, a gamer type person... Once they have played that mechanic, unless it is a mechanic of death, will have no need to ever play it again. Here's a perfect example. Trine. If I, I saw the trailer, if there was no demo, I would have just bought it. But there was a demo. I still haven't bought it yet. Yeah, well, uh, you know, well, I'll I might play... buy it when three people want to play it, but I haven't bought it yet. Or like as Yahtzee pointed out about that explosion game, you know, the guy who blows himself up to do stuff. It's a great, awesome Wasn't mechanic. Wasn't that one of the uh, Pex-10? I don't think so. Uh, I think it might have been. I don't think so. I'll look through. But anyway, he, he pointed out that it's a great and novel mechanic for 25 levels. And then it's 25 levels if they ran out of ideas. Yep. All right. So let's see what else happened. Is that all for Friday? You keep petering out. I thought you had notes. I do, but I lose my space in the notes because I don't have a marker because I'm on DS screen. I'm on my <sighs> iPhone screen. So after that, we're hanging out in the DS lounge. Lounge 2. None of those other sissy lounges. And uh, one thing... Pax was trying to break the world record of the most DSs played in one space at the same time because uh, yeah. the world record was like 300 and something. Yeah, I figured they would get up to 1,000 something, but they only got, what, 900? I mean, I they, think they blew it away by two, you know, by getting like 300% uh, more, but uh, they still, it wasn't, I thought it was going to be thousands. I didn't think it would be because people didn't care. I didn't want to bother like getting my DS out, going up there, waiting. Yeah. Uh, oh, well. But that night, the concerts, the, you know, the Monday concerts. This year, they really... Monday concerts. Whoa, no, Monday, Friday yeah. concerts. The, the problem this year wasn't really a problem per se, but they, the concerts were definitely led toward Saturday. Like, Saturday was the big concert, and Friday was a lot more laid back and a lot less looked forward to by a lot of people. A lot of people seem to leave the Friday concert early, even though it ended with MC Front a lot. I mean, a Friday you had Anamana Gucci, who they're okay. I mean, I'm not like a huge fan of them, but they put on an okay show. I guess I like them, but I like their music in the background or while I'm playing games. I don't like it so much like as mm -hmm. an active concert. Yeah, then there was Metroid Metal. They were pretty cool. You know, it, it was like sort of a combination of 
a bunch of different guys from like, you know, uh, Arm Cannon and some other, uh, you know, uh, video game metal bands. And uh, they played Metroid Metal. They were Their name was not false advertising. And it was Metroid songs and metal. And it was okay. But then it wasn't front- like, you know, oh, my God, this is the greatest. But by the, then the front came out and did his usual front set. And it was awesome. Uh, MC Frontalot rocked the house. I love MC Frontalot. Oh, shit. Even though it, it definitely a lot of people, like, the, the place was barely crowded at all by the end when we left. Like, a lot of people walked out after the first it few was minutes of Anamana Gucci. very late. In fact, I brought my Pip-Boy puppet to the Friday concert and early on there's a whole bunch of other pit boys so we all get together almost everyone with one left before Metroid Metal even came out I was like the last one there yeah anyway that was pretty much it for Friday we went to bed after those concerts I I was just I was so wrecked I was wrecked and then we woke up on Saturday, luckily our and there Saturday was more panel bags. our Saturday panel on Saturday was not until like 11:30 so we had plenty of time or no, I think it was a 10.30. Regardless, it was not as early as the Sunday panel. Mm. So losing should be fun. We had to move up to the Wolfman Theater. Now, I know for the Friday panel, Beyond Candyland, we had asked if we could get two wireless mics, and they pulled some shenanigans and got one. So Saturday, we go to the Wolfman Theater, and we're like, can we get wireless mics? And they're like, we don't have any. Yeah, some other theater took them yesterday for some panel that asked for them. And I was like, ah. Damn it. That was us. We stole damn from it. our future selves. Damn it, damn it, damn it. <laughs> we stole from the uh, the Wolfman Theater to the Raven Theater. And then we went from the Wolfman Theater, the Raven Theater, to the Wolfman Theater. Thus, we didn't have wireless mics for Losing Should Be Fun. Losing Should Be Fun, though, was in a bigger theater, the Wolfman Theater. Yep. And there are a crazy ton of people. It I didn't got... fill 100%, but it filled like 90%. And yep. it was definitely more, it was definitely the most attended panel because uh, it was a bigger room and it was 90% full. And also, people kept trickling in as the panel went on. I think it was full by the end. Yeah, it might have been. And like one guy walked out, but his cell phone was going, so. Yeah. It was really weird because basically I had to hold this mic that was intended only for people sitting at the table and I was holding it up in the air so I could stand. And if I would have sat down, no one would have seen me because I would have been behind this table Meanwhile, was not on a raised platform. I cleverly took the podium. There was only one podium. It was not... Very not fair at all. Well, you could have taken it. You just didn't want it enough. I took it first. But it was, it was sitting on the, the podium was a, sort of in a bad position all the way on the right wall. Much better to be in the middle of the room. Losing should be fun went really well. People seem to really dig it. The, the moment in that panel, the two times I've run it, that is the moment I wait for, is when I put up that slide of that choose your own adventure book, UFO 5440. Yep. Because that's when like everything clicks for apparently, everyone in the audience. Apparently that book uh, changed uh, Jared Sorensen's life in some way. <laughs> <laughs> I rented that book from like my elementary school library. Yeah. And I didn't realize it was broken because I just like read the book chrono- like page by page just to see all the endings. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was a good panel. Panel also, we got really good questions at the end of that panel. Yeah, we didn't do too many, but they were all like really great questions. I left like 10 minutes at the end for questions. And, and even afterward, people asked great questions. And it was just all, overall, it was a great panel. And I was glad we did it. I'm gonna, we're not going to do this panel again. But what I'm going to do is break it up into two or three separate panels and do them over the years. Like I want to do a panel just about victory conditions and then a separate panel about losing in role playing games. Yep. So is this when we went into the PC area or not? I don't remember. Well, the thing is, I want to point out that when we walked out of this panel, you know, Jared was there at the panel. I think Luke was in the audience, too. Luke Crane. And Jared was like, that was a great panel. Too bad everything you said was wrong. Yep. But no, all his point was, and he's right, I just didn't make this clear enough. He said that if the future of, all ga- if the future of gaming and losing is, you know, the Dwarf Fortress style enriching the world procedural content generation, then there will be no more narrative. And he had this whole, like, question and response in this whole like criticism of my panel and the only response i had was yeah i didn't make it clear that it's not the end of all of gaming it's just that procedural content like that will fill in the gaps and the background for the narrative yeah it's you know there's a lot there's a lot to be said there and you know you can't say everything there is to say in a 60 minute panel well that's the that's the thing with all three of the panels we did at pax were not the kind of specific detailed like very in-depth panel they were very much the Low hanging fruit of Geek Nights gaming panels. It's the kind of the pa- kind of panels we do are the kind of things to get you thinking, not to make a big statement or anything. Yep, but we're gonna now that we've gotten the low hanging fruit out of the way, we've got to do the crazy specific like awesome. I want to do some panels like about real like individual games. Like this is Natural Selection, you know, or this is Puerto Rico. I want to do that kind of stuff. You know, I wonder how many people want to see it though. 
it's hard to say. I, I'm gauging that we gained a following by the end of PAX. So I think next year, end of PAX East, we're going to be able to, people will come to our panels just because we're running them, regardless of what the title is. Hopefully. So we'll get like this following half, and hopefully the other half will be random people yeah. walking in. Yeah, so I'll talk about the, I, I don't remember if this is when we went there, but I'll talk about the PC gaming area. We didn't go there till uh, later. Yeah, I just want to talk about it now, just because I remember it. Because right after this, we went to the tabletop gaming area, and we played that little uh, tile game, Hive. All right, the Hive game. It was a fun little game. You have the like, you have the little Hive, and you place all your pieces, and then you jump them around, and you try to surround the other person's queen. And while it's a game that's fiddly and feels like it could go on forever, you it, it is a game where a clever player can force equip a mate effectively. And I liked it. I might just buy it. You gonna that, where are you gonna find it? I'll find it somewhere, eBay, if I have to. Yeah, that, that's not the kind of game. It looks like it's easy to get. But yeah, it was an interesting game. We had little bugs, and you you put them out, and you position them, and you you know. Scott thought he had me because he went for the quick victory. The problem was I went for the direct route. His quick direct victory. Me? So he you know he's almost surrounded my guy. But then I basically just locked in all his guys who were surrounding my guy. He couldn't finish it, and then I just leisurely surrounded his queen and ended the game. He couldn't stop me. Yeah, well, because the only way to stop me was to put take all of his pressure off of my queen. It was great. Yep, it was okay. And uh, we didn't actually play, but we taught these cool people who were inspired by our panel to play Puerto Rico. Well, no, first we played Blockus with some people. Oh yeah, we ran into those people who played Blockus with them, and then we played Puerto Rico. Yep. Well, we taught the same people how to play Puerto Rico. Yep. But we didn't actually play it. And we didn't get to play all the way through. We played a couple of rounds, and definitely, it is so much better to have someone else teach you a game than to learn it yourself. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I feel like we should run panels that are basically learn how, like, an hour-long panel. Learn how to play Puerto Rico and Teeny. Well, that's why I'm sort of excited to get some gaming space at PAX East as opposed to, you know, some panel space. Because I can just basically teach people games all day. And the best thing is you go to a gaming con, right? It'll take you a long time to learn how to play a game for the instruction book. Like, possibly an hour if it's a complicated game worth playing. And then... You basically lost an hour of your convention. If someone taught you how to play the game, you could have saved 45 convention minutes. That's a big freaking deal, all right? So it's all about teaching people how to play games and then learning how to play games from other people. So pretty much right after that, though, the reason we had to bail is that we had to go line up for the make a strip and then, you know, go get some food. And the make a strip did not actually happen at that point. And after, basically, we get there and we line up. We get it really good seats. And, We're all set to and go. it's delayed a little bit. So basically, we sat there and they did a and a again. They didn't even have uh, Jerry there because he uh, he formed Vabby. Yep. <laughs> so it's Scott Kurtz and Gabe, right? Uh, well, Mike Krahulik. And basically, they're trying to get his, you know, computer to work with the Photoshop I'll sum on this the up. screens. We sat there for 45 minutes while he clicked on the same resolution over and over again, and it didn't work. And meanwhile, people asked questions. But I got to say, they were answering the questions pretty funnily. But Gabe and Tycho together is where the magic happens. They just, like, the answers were classy in the Wyatt Wells sense, but they were not... Full on classy. They were not. They were not as classy yeah. as they could have been. Yeah, I wasn't lining up for more Q and A. I was lining up to see make a strip, and uh, it did not happen. So eventually, we, we just bailed and got some food at that awesome uh, mall. So food Scott court. Kurtz did mention Kate Beaton, so he gets points. He did, yeah. and we wooed with a few other people that wooed. Yep, that was pretty. You know. Anyway. Yep, so we went back to Tabletop, hanging out there some more. Uh, Luke Crane was running a whole bunch of Burning Wheel on Saturday. Yeah, he did some Burning Wheel with some sort of, like, court of undead something something. I want to play that. What the hell was that? Yeah, I walked in, that one before. and one player was pleading his case before the court, and I heard the words, Your Honor, I did not know at the time that they were vampires. Yeah, right? It was so great. Whatever that game was, Luke, I want get, send me a copy and a PDF. Also, I want to play it. Now, apparently, Luke is running, like, he ran this campaign that was a continuation of a campaign he ran at PAX last year. I didn't know this. I didn't hear this. And also, Jared Sorensen, of all people, had never, until that time, played the sword. Oh my gosh. So he, he was kind of geeking about it, and he was the elf, and it's hard to be the elf, because you feel like you can just kill everyone and take the sword, but that never works out. No, it doesn't. But we ran into some other people later who played the sword, and they loved it, and people... People are really digging. They also did some mouse guard demos I saw. Yeah. And uh, later, I was happy. You know, I got to talk to Tycho for a brief moment. And he recognized me enough to be like, yeah, I heard some people were playing this, the playing mouse guard at this con. I was like, yeah, it was yesterday. You missed it. And he was like, oh, uh, damn. You know, the thing is, I think he's just really good. I like, what he, you know, the way he uh, talks. It's like, you go up to him and say, hey, how about the game Summer Flange? But like, yeah, I heard about that Summer Flange. No, 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 because he mentioned mouse guard unprompted to me. Really? Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'll talk about that later when it happened. But basically, we're, we played a bunch of Dominion. 
with uh, Ro and Jeremy, and we you know we saw other people playing Dominion. Yeah, Dominion is a game like I, I, the game got really popular on Board Game Geek, and I checked it out. And basically, it's a game that's a collectible card game, but it's not collectible, right? So that makes me excited because that's what I always wanted. But then in Anime Boston, we opened it up, and I read the rules, and I was like. Eh, these rules don't look so good. From reading the rules, the game looked a bit shit, and I guess, the, here's the deal, we didn't but knock it. the game was hyped up big time, so you know what? I don't knock it without trying it. So at PAX, someone knew how to play, we didn't have to teach it to ourselves. Game's fucking awesome, I bought Dominion and Dominion Intrigue online today, it's already shipped, it's coming. It's not a hardcore game in the old sense, like it's not a Puerto Rico or a TNE, but it plays quick. It's real fun. It's just, it, it has these novel mechanics that I want to pull into other games. Oh, yeah. The whole making your deck while you're playing. And there's a new set coming out, Dominion Seaside, with some water cards. So I'm all about Dominion. Get as much Dominion as you can. And the game is so different every time you play because you kind of create the world in which you're yeah, going to make the game. Basically, yeah, it's like you, bu- you get this box of cards and there's like all kinds of different cards in there, but you pick 10 different ones every time you play. And if you get multiple boxes, there's just so many exponentially more combinations of 10 cards you can pick to play the game with. So it's like, oh, fuck yes, you can play this game forever. Like with three sets, you're never going to run out of combinations ever. Right? This game will entertain you for a long time. But, like, one game, like, the, the final scores were, like, I think row one with, like, 24. Yeah, the first, no, the first, 23. the first game I won by one. Oh, 28 over your 27. Yep. And the second game, my final score was negative one. Yes. I got hosed. Scott's score was negative one in the curse game, where <laughs> basically we went through the entire curse deck in, like, a, like almost nothing. Because everyone kept getting cursed constantly. I And I, I, I won the first game because I managed to get rid of a lot of my curses. But in the second game, I was just burdened with too many curses. I couldn't do anything. But then we had a really nice game. It was like the opposite of the Bastard game, where it was mostly constructive stuff. And everyone else tried to do some cool combinations, doing lo- what felt good of playing like... I got like a whole bunch of markets and they, then played them successfully. Scott's playing all these combos. He's like, market, 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 market. Meanwhile, I just bought silver and I bought provinces. Silver provinces, silver provinces, and I just won the game with a million points. And no one could stop me. Silver is definitely the way to go. For reals, that's and gold and a lot of gold too. Gold is okay. Gold is great. Gold is. Are good. you kidding? I like gold. You got to get rid of your copper. That's the thing. That's you gotta get rid of the copper and the curse. I was trashing copper. Yeah, you to gotta, make more room. That's right. Gotta, also, I got all these cards. Let me discard out of my hand. It was great. Yeah. Now, as we're walking around down to the bodega, bodega, yeah, to get some uh, beverages. Uh, little known secret in tabletop gaming, that area. Go down the escalators out of the convention center. Turn right. Go right across the street. There's a bodega. Get all your beverages there. They got every beverage. Anything they also is- have they also have uh, mini snack, mini crunchy donuts, twenty five cents. Twenty five cents. Ice cream sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy who runs is pretty cool. We ran into a guy who had nothing to do with packs. But he's just like some guy who works in the area, like he owns a business. And I think, he's like, you know, I think he worked at a steakhouse as a waiter. And he was like, you know what? PAX is like the best thing to happen to Seattle. You guys spend so much money, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> and you're all cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people didn't have as many good things to say about certain other unnamed cons that happen in Seattle. <laughs> we played this game called uh, Quarto. It sucks. It sucks. It's just, it, it looked like some sort of abstract strategy game, but really it's just a left right game and there was nothing to it. Yep, Scott won it like all of the three times we played it and then we put it away and that was the end of that. That was the end of that. But uh, there was this game, we're walking out to the bodega and we see these guys, these people playing this game with all these plastic dog figures, really big ones, and they had them all lined up like in a row. So we're like, man, does the game play that way or are you guys just bored? But they're like, no, the game plays this way. And I was like, this game looks like it sucks. And they're like, yeah, but we're going to try it. So I gave him my business card. And I was like, all right, I do a radio show. Let me know how bad this game sucks. And I forgot about it. Like two hours later, I get this phone call from a number I don't recognize. And this guy's just like, that dog game sucks ass. And that's it. That's all he said. <laughs> so it was good I to know. I saw a lot of people playing interesting games. Like this, a lot of people played this game Wasabi. That was like a sushi making game. Jared was intrigued by that game. Yeah, I was intrigued by it as well. Uh, you know, it looked good. I mean, I didn't get to play it, but you know. Uh, what are the games that I see people playing? I saw Primarily, I saw people playing Munchkin and Dominion. And at one point, I taught like 10 people how to play Agricola at once. That was pretty good. That was actually on this day. You, you we, Basically, we saw these people playing Agricola, learning how to play, and we're like, they're like, yeah, we were inspired by your panels. We just got the game. We're going to play it. So Scott's about to teach them how to play, and I noticed next to them is another group of people, and I thought they were playing Agricola, but no, they were trying to learn. So I was like, uh, listen to that guy. He'll teach you how to play. 
So I taught everyone how to play Agricola. Laser, I, I met one of the guys who played Agricola in the bathroom, and he's like, yeah, I totally won. Ah, ha, 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 ha. So at this moment, you know, we realize there's this big Steve Jackson area, and we see, of all people, Steve Jackson well, himself. Saw, I saw it on the Twitters, like, Steve Jackson signing under the escalator. And well, behold, there he is under the escalator. Yeah, I, we saw Steve Jackson. I hadn't Jackson. seen him in, like, five years. So we uh, we went up to him, and uh, Philip Reed was there, too. Was another, he's the COO of uh, Steve, Steve Jackson, Jackson Games. Games. They're but, making, man, Steve Jackson Games, like, the Munchkin must be making them so much fucking money. Oh, my God. Especially, you know, Munchkin's kind of cool the way they've got it. Like, you know, while we're talking, some guy comes up who's a fan of Steve Jackson in the games. And they gave him this coin, and it they have the rule for the coin changes like whenever Steve Jackson game feels like it. So you go online, you can find out what the rule is. If you've got that coin, it changes the game of Munchkin with everyone else you're playing. Damn. So the, Munchkin wasn't that good early on because it was just kind of this okay card game, but now that it is nothing more than a meta game, it's like it's cooler in my eyes. It's a game. It has that magic of what Magic the Gathering had before the internet. You'd show up at a game and someone whips out this crazy card and you're like, ah, shit. Well, I mean, you know, it's all, it's a non-collectible game that plays like a collectible (laughs) card game, sort of, which which is what I like about, you know, Dominion, but it's not actually a good uh, game. I don't have any desire to play it. But it has all these meta rules and it encourages meta gaming. I mean, if you wear Munchkin merchandise, you get a bonus. Yep. So what if a guy comes with like a hundred Munchkin t-shirts on? Yep. Oh, man. So... We go up to Steve Jackson, and we won't tell the whole story again, but we got closure on, on something. On the previous Steve Jackson story. The last time we had talked to Steve Jackson, there were unresolved issues. We got closure on all of them. Yep, it was a very good time. Steve Jackson was awesome. We're going to try to like get an interview with him. or Actually, I'd really like to talk to Philip Reed, because that guy seemed really, really cool. Yeah, he definitely seemed like he knew what was going on. But apparently the Steve Jackson story at PAX was that he personally did not go to the last PAX, but people in his organization did. And yeah, they he had all these like uh, guys who had shirts that were like, you know, like uh, they're like they're like Steve Jackson games secret crew or whatever. So he basically he was forced to go to PAX and he was like PAX was super awesome. But there is more Steve Jackson. We'll get back to that. Mm-hmm. So after all that, we're walking around looking for stuff to do before the lineup for the crazy awesome Saturday night concerts. And we see the bring your own computer area. And Scott's like, why don't we just see if we can get in there? Well, Actually, we forgot to mention on Friday we went into the, you know, Use a computer they provide for you area, which is all these Dell machines, like hundreds of them. It was crazy. I'll say this. It would have been cool, except that Steam and Valve are assholes when it comes to LAN gaming, and they basically fucked packs. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing was, if you wanted to play a game that was installed, like if you wanted to play Counter-Strike or TF2, you were in business. Like, it was, you know, the thing is, we want to play some NS. Sorry, no go. Not only that, you couldn't even log into your own Steam account because of the way Valve runs these things. Yeah. Tax had no control over that, though. So, like, what can I say? Yeah, it's basically, well, all those machines are provided by sponsors, I'm pretty sure, like Intel, Dell, Steam, whoever, you know, whoever provides them, I don't even know, right? So, it's not something that, see, you know, PAX has a lot of control over, but, you know, they basically install games on there, and that's what you can play, and in case you didn't bring your own computer. And a lot of people go in there and play, you know, because a lot of people want to play Team Fortress 2 or Left 4 Dead or whatever, so there you go. Yep, it was okay, and a lot of people were playing Left 4 Dead, but then, you know, we, we wanted to go into the Bring Your Own Computer area, but you need a special badge. Look at Penny Arcade and PAX's Brilliance. The, the best way to stop theft is just to, you can only go in if you brought a computer. Yep. So it already limits it to the people who are into that sort of thing. So I go up to the guy, you know, there's like four enforcers at the door. There's no way you're getting in that room unless you brought your own computer, right? And I'm like, hey, listen, uh, I'm a speaker. I didn't bring my own computer, but I just want to go around and look at the sweet modded rigs in there. And the guy's just like, come on, I'll show you around. Well, no, first he's like, no, I can't let just let you in. <laughs> he's like, but you know what? Just follow me. I'll take you around. Yeah. So he takes us in, and we got to look at, like, all the awesome cases. Yep, and that was where I saw the winner, you know, of the mod case contest was the NFC Systems guy. And is it was it deserved to be the winner. It was so fucking awesome. I got to say, though, that, that case with the vacuum tubes on it, I thought it was cool. And while the judges gave them uh, bad criticism for the external power supply... I thought the external power supply was awesome. I think he, I think the external power supply was awesome. I think he just needed to style up the external power supply for some extra awesomes. Yeah, you know, but it was basically just an external power supply. It the cool thing is, it was like an entirely different con in that room. It reminded me of the land parties I used to go to when I yeah, was. Yeah, I mean, basically, right? You look at the way Pax goes, and there are a lot of enforcers who stay in one area, like the like. If you look at like the console area at Pax, was basically the equivalent of all of Game Katsu, right? 
It was basically game Katsu in there. If you went in that room and didn't leave it, it was no different than being at game in, in the game area of Katsukata and not leaving it. All right? Ex minus the arcade machines. Going in the PC LAN area was basically like going to any old LAN party and you just don't leave. And a lot of people just went to that LAN party and that's, that was their con, the LAN party. It's totally awesome. I'm thinking for PAX East, if I can swing it with PAX all PAX the... East, everyone bring your own computer. It's NS2. Tribes and, 2. I don't know, because we're... Revival, you know, we called it. We still have to talk to uh, Khalil and all... We have to set up what we're doing for PAX East. We might be doing too much stuff at PAX East. We might be, much like Gabe and Tycho, <laughs> ghosts at PAX. As in, we're only doing events and then we disappear. Well, this is why we're going to have people do arrange some of this stuff in our name. We're going to make it happen, even if we're not physically there making it happen. Right? Yes, but PAX East, uh, we can't talk about PAX East. But bring your own computer to PAX East. Trust me. I'm, I'm bringing to, mine. I'm going to have to upgrade mine before I bring it. Mine's, uh, not, mine's not hardcore enough. I just need to get one of those carrying straps for mine. So, the Saturday night concert... Freeze Pop had new songs. Totally awesome, even though the, the dude retired. <laughs> yeah, that was sad. But you know what? It was it was very it was a very touching moment when he announced his retirement. And then as like this final, like the big song for him, they did Freeze Pop Forever. Yep. It almost brought a tear to my eye. It was really cute. It was awesome. But uh, Paul and Storm. I was surprised, like, how many Freeze Pop songs I knew. <laughs> it's like, oh, I know all these songs. What's funny? Fuck? Because Freeze Pop was a band that was basically catapulted to newfound success, like a re success because of these games. But they know it. It's not like it was like, you know, oh, we're not, we're trying to avoid it. It's like they know it and they embrace it. They're like, yeah, we know that we're popular. They were straight up. The they're like, they, like they, it was very heartfelt when they pointed out that, look, you guys at PAX, like people like you, you made us happen. Mm hmm. But it, now I'm glad people know who they were because, you know, early on, like, like I'd say six months before PAX, I only knew Freeze Bop as that band that did that. Alex said he didn't know who they were until they played that song, which, of course, is the last one they played. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so Paul and Storm come out and I didn't really know who they were at all, but I knew that they were obviously... Uh, some sort of geeky and awesome people because they uh, they sang with uh, MC Frontlot a little bit yep. the previous night. So I'm like, huh, I wonder how those people do. I don't know any of their songs. I enjoyed them thoroughly. They were, like, the best. I mean, like, Jonathan Colton was awesome, but, like, I knew his stuff. So, like, Paul and Storm, I didn't know their stuff. So it was like, oh, shit, this is fucking great. I'm going to do everything. I want to see if they'll do an anime con. They're going to be in New Haven with Jonathan Colton in the relatively near future. No, I'm going to do everything in my power to get them to come to Kineticon. Oh, Imagine that. Fuck yeah. That would be like the biggest thing fuck ever. Yes. I don't know. I got to try. But Joko and, and Paul and Storm at Kineticon? Joko oh. would probably like Kineticon. He's in, he lives in Brooklyn. Why doesn't he? You know, he come on over. We'll work He's on going it. In, yeah. But the thing is, with Paul and Storm, is like some of their bits were funnier than other bits. But the bit where they were doing, like, they were basically doing impressions of other musicians. That was a good that bit. Was, that was like the funniest thing they the did. The pirate all night. song was awesome. Oh, the pirate song was And it was also was every time they did something for the ladies. They definitely <laughs> combine the filky kind of songs with the stagemanship. Well, and I the mean, that's the thing. Is the most problem with filk is that filk usually means no talent. And one thing that I realized... <laughs> that was a burn. One thing I realized is that all the musicians that they had at PAX this year were like... Like, I didn't really fully realize, like, the at the crazy high levels of musical talent that were present on the stage. Like, the dude, like, MC Frontlot's bassist, like, also played guitar, also played the kazoo very, very well. You know, it's like uh, Paul and Storm were obviously incredibly musically talented. They could play all sorts of stuff. You know, it was just sort of like, you know, how talented all these people were. You know, if you could, t I, I could tell, like, I, I'm not musically talented. I can tell by the pixels. But I can tell musical talent when I see it. But know? the thing about Paul and Storm, you know who they really remind me of? Dana Carvey. It's the musical stand-up act. You think so? Musical stand-up is so wonderful because how rare... I think rare, it's like, yeah, Dana Carvey plus Simon and Garfunkel. How rare is it to have someone who is both musically talented and comedically talented? Yeah, kind of. I mean, it, it, Paul and Storm, I, I look forward to seeing you guys in the future. You guys were great. And I got to download all their musics. And, of course, Joko. The fact that Paul and Storm sang backup vocals for Joko, like, 
Joko basically well, I think does turn together, so it's sort of like you know. Joko basically does the same set at like every year. Like it was the exact same thing, minus the Rickroll. Yep. And he didn't. He do got the Rickrolled song. by the audience instead. That was so beautiful. And then he's, he's like, "Yeah, I deserved it." He comes <laughs> out, everyone's cheering, the crowd gets quiet. One thing is that last year it seemed like John. You know, obviously, you know, this is probably not true, but at least. Jonathan Colton's presence on stage last year was sort of like, you know, yeah, I'm doing the concert. All right. This year he was like smiling and he couldn't like contain himself this year. So, you know, that was uh, much awesome. But one, you know, the audience gets quiet and before he can start singing and suddenly you hear all these people yelling in the background and then you realize that they're all in unison singing. (laughs) It was beautiful. Yeah. But. He basically did the same set he did last year, and I have a feeling that he does the same set at every pass. Well, he doesn't have, you know, when has he had a new song? Not so recently. Come on, Joko, write some new songs, but... He's probably writing them now. While it was basically the same set, he had Paul and Storm singing backup vocals with him, and that made it, like, it was like all the songs over again, because it added so much. He also had Molly, the girl with the ukulele. That was really good. Ukulele. 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 Okay. Does anyone get that joke? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it all started when I drank 48 glasses of lemonade. As a aside, PAX is great because I can make inside baseball jokes about gaming and like three quarters of the audience will get it. I make anime jokes about recent anime at Otakon and no one has any idea what I'm talking about. Yep. Uh, let's see. What uh, are, we, are we? We're winding down here pretty much. I On think. Saturday at least. Yeah. So Sunday. Sunday we couldn't... Seattle, I love you, but you do not have the breakfast that we can get in New York. Yeah, you have crepes, but you don't have, like, fucking bagels or... uh, There's, like, one bagel place that's, like, down by the water that's hard to get to and wasn't open when we needed it to be open. However, what Seattle does have... where are the fucking breakfast sandwiches? Yeah, basically... I need a bacon, egg, and cheese on a croissant. The only quick breakfast we could get was at the bodega. I had a can of Red Bull and a Kit Kat for breakfast on Sunday. You know, this morning, I went to a deli, and I got three pancakes for $3. It was fucking awesome. You know what I can say, though? That was in New York. (laughs) While it was a Kit Kat and Red Bull breakfast... It was a white chocolate Kit Kat. We don't get that Actually, shit out here. you know here. what? We went to that the Mexican place in the mall, and we got an orange juice and a quesadilla for breakfast. That was actually a really good breakfast that totally revived me. However, why does that place not have breakfast burritos? We could have gotten a burrito burrito. I, that was too much. Yeah. Too early. Need, I needed, like, the egg salsa burrito with some cheese and some peppers and onion. That would have been a fucking But bad. we get into the convention early with our badges to go set up for Beyond d because this is at 10 fucking a.m. People are already lined up. I don't know how the hell they got in there. People snuck into the con before they were supposed to and got in line for Beyond d with normal attendee badges and the, the enforcers, to their credit, who were at the room, did not kick them out, did not say, hey, how'd you get in? They were like, all right, line up. up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the room did not... Fill, uh, but the room, you know, it started out about half full, and then the rest sort of filled in as the panel went on. And was, I can't it, blame people for not showing up it was about, at 10 a.m. It was, on Sunday. It was about 75% full when we started, and it was about 90% full by the time we ended. Yeah, it was good. It wasn't a bad, none, none of our panels had a bad turnout, you know. Yeah, it, I mean, it was. we had more people there than we got at anything at Connecticut. Yeah. But we ran Beyond D&D. It was a pretty typical running of Beyond yep. D&D. I was a little tired. I got I got sidetracked once or twice. We were definitely not fully on game, but Scott was on fire with the jokes. He made up for me being so tired. All right. Yeah, we, uh, let's see. Oh, and then, right, so here's the awesome thing, is that we noticed when we arrived to the Beyond D&D that one of the panels in the room, they basically have black tape, and they, they tape over panels when they're done. We noticed that one of the panels in the middle of the day, like 1 p.m. on Sunday, was taped over, even though it didn't happen yet. I don't even know what panel it was. So it was canceled. I'm like, okay. So we're in the room. We got our awesome enforcers We're in the room, and, and Jared Sarazin is like, I want to do Action Castle. So suddenly I'm like, one of the panels in this room is canceled. Yep, so we go to the enforcer, and we're like, hey, is there really nothing in this room at 1 o'clock? And he's like, uh, as far as we know, no. We're like, we have something crazy awesome you could run. Just trust us. Give us the room. So they call up Khalil White, who's someone we've interacted with frequently but never actually met. And he shows up, finally. Yep, because they're like, <laughs> yeah, it's... No, this would never happen at any other con. <laughs> this is why Pax is so awesome. And Khalil White, of course, he shows up, and he's the awesomest dude. And- so... So basically, the enforcers are like, this is totally cool. We just have to make sure that Mr. White is okay with it. So he shows up just for the panel, and I- I'm-, I'm very pleased to meet him in person, but he basically said, you know what? It's really stupid that we haven't talked in person before this, and we're going to be talking to him about PAX East very shortly. Yeah, he and- works for Reed Exhibitions, managing the PAX East and West and yes, such. Yes, apparently his office is like right next to Pete Tatera, who we work with who for we, like every anime con. All the time. Yeah, so right. PAX East is going to be crazy awesome because we... like. We have some insight into the things they're planning on doing, 
and we have avenues to get people to do them better and cheaper. Yep. So anyway, that that was awesome. And of course, we had Jared. And he, of course, he let us have the room at, at 1 p.m. for the Action Castle. Yep. So we had Jared and Luke in the room, and they stood up and waved. And then we told every basically. This panel that was not in the schedule, we managed to get a lot of people to show up for this panel that was not scheduled. Yeah, we did the tweets. Everyone tweeted. I everyone... walked into every tabletop room and I was like, all right, guys, this game, come play a game with us in the theater. Yep. And we had a lot of people to show up and Jared ran Action Castle. Now, while we were waiting for this to happen, there was some downtime. So between the two, we played Citadels. We taught some people how to play this game. We didn't finish that game, though. While that game was going on, I randomly ran into Gabe and Tyka. Nah. Scott was in the room, and I was on my way to the bodega, and someone taps me on the shoulder, and they're like, hey, can you take a picture for us? I'm like, oh, okay. And then I turn around, and I realize that standing in front of me are Gabe and Tyka. Uh-huh. So I took a picture of Gabe and Tyka and some guy. All right. And then, you know, I talked to him for a little bit. And Tycho, you know, Jerry, unsolicited, is, you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, I ran the Beyond D&D last year, and we're running stuff this year. And he's like, oh, yeah, you know what? I heard there was some mouse guard going on on IthisCon. And I was like, yeah, it happened on Saturday, sadly. He's like, ah, damn. <laughs> but then, you know, I, was, I couldn't bother them. They were obviously on their way somewhere. So I congratulated him on forming Babby. And then I let him get on his way. And Luke and Jared kind of bump in. And Luke's like, blah, 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 blah. And he invite, they invite those two guys to come to Action Castle. Mm-hmm. And to their credit, Jerry pulls out his schedule. Like probably the schedule that Robert Koo gave to him. He's like, don't deviate from this. Yeah, I actually know what Robert Koo looks like now because I actually saw him a few times at the convention. Yeah, I, I didn't kept stop ru- him, though, because he was a busy man. I he kept was- running into him, and every time I was like, I want to bother you, but just go on your way. <laughs> <laughs> but he pulls out his schedule, and he looks at it, and he has something circled at 1 o'clock. So he's like, ah, oh, I can't go. Uh. But I see later, hey, Steve Jackson's back. So I go to Jared. I'm like, Jared, go invite Steve Jackson to your action castle. And he did. And Steve Jackson came to Action Castle. Uh, what did he come to? Action Castle. That's correct. He came to the Action Castle. Oh, my God. Action Castle was so crazy. And again, so I, you know, I, my plan was to grief the Action Castle. And Jared's like, you can't grief it, right? All you get is like one move. What's the worst you can do? Like go up the tree and down the tree again. It's like, you know, go backwards. You know, you can kill self. You can restart, but you can't really, you know, you can't do that much damage. So I see Scott, you know, I didn't play, I just took pictures of the audience. I see Scott like standing there like on a mission and he gets up there and he's like, drop lamp. Right. So the thing is, from playing Action Castle before, I knew that you start with a lamp in your inventory. Nobody in the whole game had checked the inventory yet, so no one else knew. So I go up there and I drop lamp and Jared makes a face and he's just like, he says, you drop the lamp. Nobody picked up the lamp. And they went all the way to Action Castle. In fact, they got so far, they saved the game without the lamp. They saved the the game in the princess's chambers. They didn't have the lamp. They had to go all the way back and get the lamp. And then all the way back again. And then when I got my... I only had two turns because there were a lot of people in line. On my second turn, I climbed the tree. It took a long time just because I could. And we had to go up the tree and down the tree. No, the cool thing was, and this is why PAX is so great, why the enforcers are so great. The dude, I'm sorry I forgot your name. You're like my best friend who is like, run, like all these people running the Raven the Theater. The Raven Theater managers? Yeah, those he, guys are the best. He was like, okay, what does Action Castle entail? We, told, we explained it to him. We didn't, you know, normally, it, like if we're at Oticon and we need like something special, we basically have to like explicitly explain like this, then this, then this, then this, then this forever. And even then they'll still cock it up. Here... All we did was explain what Action Castle was. And he was like, so they'll line up in front of the mic? We're like, yep. He's like, got it. And he walks away. He took the line, turnstile style, through the chairs lined up at the back of the room and formed the entire line inside the room. And he had everyone who already did their turn walk out the exit at the front and get in line at the back of the room again. Yep. He came up with this on his own immediately, and all the other enforcers made it happen. And he didn't need to ask anyone for permission either. He just did it. Oh my God, Pax, you're like, you guys, seriously, I cannot give you enough props. You enforcers are like. Something so simple, but yet, compared to the others, such a big deal. And it's all that little simple shit that makes the con 10,000 times the awesome. You who take up the black, I salute you. But. We've got the line, and I see Steve Jackson in line. He came, he's in line, and he is clearly having a great time. Yep. So he is one person away from taking his turn, and the dude in front of him walks up with that grief look and says, reset game. Resetting. And (laughs) 
<laughs> Welcome to Action Castle. And Jared looks at Steve Jackson, and Steve Jackson looks at him, and they both shake their heads, <laughs> and Steve Jackson says, Load save slot one. Uh, now loading. <laughs> and then he did. I wonder how many people in the room realized that was Steve Jackson. I don't know. P- I, people even know who Steve Jackson is. I one mean, thing I can say, Steve Jackson, do, but, he yeah. tweeted later and he was like, Action Castle was amazing. Yep. So that so, was totally awesome. No, it's, that it's, was like super wicked awesome. It was really interesting to run Action Castle or to see it run for a group of gamers. Because, you know, Jared ran it for us at Kineticon, which was mostly non gamers. And, like, the crowd was, in one way, worse at Action Castle because they didn't understand text adventures. But in many ways, much better because they weren't jerk griefers. They didn't even think they just They were just playing it straightforwardly. They didn't know any text adventure stuff. They didn't know to save and load. They only knew to save because Pete told them that, you know, Pete gave it away. But it's interesting how the people who had played a lot of games... Where pro- like their prior experience hurt them in Action Castle because they they had these preconceived notions and it was really interesting and Jared and I talked about that a lot after Action Castle. Yeah, it's very very interesting. But it took thirty minutes. The game ended. They won with a score I believe ninety eight out of a hundred because they didn't give the rose to the princess after they they gave her the, the rose to the princess, but they didn't do it again after loading the game. So yeah. Yep. But. And after it all, you know, we had a half hour left in the room. And instead of, you know, kicking us out or whatever, the enforcer was like, you guys got the room for a half hour. Got to want to do anything cool? So we just took questions for a half hour. So me, Jared, and Scott, we sat down. And we had, by then, you know, other people were like, don't stay unless you have nothing better to do. Seriously. So only about 60 people stayed. And we're like, all right, we can take like three or four questions. Do not use semicolons in your question. Don't make a statement. Ask a good question. Seriously. We'll totally dismiss you. And we got all great questions. The greatest question was the guy who was like, you play all this wide variety of games. And I'm like, I'm about to explain, oh, how I play this wide variety of games. He's like, no, no, no. My question is, (laughs) right? So I was answering the wrong question, first of all. And then he's like, you know, where is there still room for gaming to grow? And I was like, oh, man, what a great question. And actually, we talked about the unfulfilled potential. Yep, and it gave me a bunch of ideas for panels, too. So, dude, if you're listening, email us and tell us who you were because you realize you inspired three brand new panels that we're going to do at cons. Yeah, that's a good, very good question. Like, the unresolved potential is going to be a whole panel that's basically going to be why Nintendo... Unfulfilled potential. Yes. Yep. But we did this panel. It was really fun. And I got to say, I want to do... One, I want to get Jared and Luke to do, like, their own panels at, at cons. But two, doing a Q&A roundtable with Jared Sorensen was really cool because... He has insights that we do not see, and we agree, you know, we disagree on a lot of big points in gaming, but it amazes me how much we agree on that doesn't come up when we normally talk, because we don't talk about the things we agree on, but then someone asks us a question, and we all, like, have the same answer. I know, right? Uh, let's see, let's talk about a bunch of little shit that's going on. Let's see, oh, we bought some PAX merch before they sold out. Yep, we got the PAX the 2009 t-shirt. Uh, uh, I'll say this again, it, you know, way before <laughs> we asked for, I still, I owe the two people who sent me those pit boy puppets crazy prizes, and someday I'll get them to you, and I'll prop you again on the show, and you'll probably, you forgot all about it, but... We got PAX 09 t-shirts. We were unable to get PAX 08 t-shirts because they sold out like right away. I don't think I'm going to ask for a PAX t-shirt though because it would have been a pre-worn one. Yeah, I don't want that. Nah. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see. There were like famous people there. Like uh, like Bill Amend had a table, the, the Foxtrot guy. But... We didn't talk to him because, you know, there was no line because he was like, like What was I going to say to him though? I well, I know we we stood there and we're like, does anyone have anything to say to them other than other than like fan stuff? And we're like, no, so we don't away. But one thing. Dude looks almost exactly like the way he draws Jason, if you look at him from the side. Oh, for reals. Uh, like, Jonan Vasquez was there, but I don't know what he looks like. And he wasn't, he was just an attendee. He wasn't, like, a, as far as I could tell, doing anything special. So it's like, how would I even know? He, I could have been playing a game with him and not even yep. know. One thing, and I'm going to, I got it. If I don't get a hold of him, everyone, everyone talk to Jonathan Colton in whatever way you can. One of our things of the day from the long time from a long co- time ago was called a story from North America. Yeah. We were going to show it to him. Like I wanted to just show it to him on my pre and be like, you can do something cool with this. You, if anyone, but you know, he was gone on Sunday and I didn't get a chance to talk to him before the concert on Saturday. So I want him to see this and do something cool with it. So help me out people out there. The NS guys from unknown worlds are supposed to have a booth. But totally they, bailed. They didn't. And that sucked. Because that was something I was looking forward to, and it wasn't there. So fuck the, uh, not fuck them. No, not fuck great, them. But come on, guys, what the hell? Seriously, I wanted to see you. Then again, hopefully they'll be at PAX East. Hopefully, we'll see. 
Uh, oh, before one of our panels, these guys uh, for, uh, who are making a mod, uh, an, an expansion or something for Dawn of War 2 were there. And uh, basically, Dawn of War 2 was that w Warhammer RTS that I had a hard time with because it was basically just a million times rock, paper, scissor. But apparently what these guys have made is they made a defense mode that's co-op. So it's like co-op defense Dawn of War. And I thought that was pretty cool. So it's like, wow, if the game was that from the get-go, I probably would have played it a lot more. All right. So after Beyond D&D, &D, we met this guy, uh, Matt Youngmark. And we talked to him a little bit, and he writes choose-your-own-adventure books. Oh, yeah, that guy. Totally and awesome. I was reading. The, he gave us a free copy of Zombocalypse Now, which is one of them. And I got to say, it's pretty great. Yeah. Like, it brings back all that fun of choose-your-own-adventures in a big way. And he's also, like, a cool gamer guy. Like, we talked to him for a while. Mm -hmm. And that, that, you know, that's... Pretty much everyone we talked to, like, I just walk up to random people and start talking to them. Like, I would just, like, I'd see people in the game room, and I'd just go up to them. Like, there are two people playing Blockus. Like, we sat down to play that Hive game, and I saw the two people across the room were playing Blockus, and I just sort of looked at them. I'm like... Ah, uh, Blockus. And they're, they're like, they pick their head up, like, huh? Then after we finish the Hive game, I just walk over, like, I'm like, Blockus, let's go. And but in <laughs> general, like, PAX, it, far and away, I did not run into anyone scary, anyone douchey, anyone jerky. No one was like a fanboy who wouldn't leave me alone. And it, it, the it scariest, says something. The scariest person that I saw who, uh, at PAX that I could remember, right? Steve Jackson? <laughs> no. No. That, no. Um, the, in the uh, Wolfman Theater, so they what some of the enforcers in there must have had dolphies because there were dolphies at the enforcer desk. However, they I were don't know who they belong to, but all of the enforcers in that room were totally chill and not scary dolphy people, even though there were dolphies there. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it, it, said, it says that's something the scariest part of facts. About there were some facts. dolphies on a desk that uh, even like Oticon anime bot any anime con we go to, I'll, we basically when we're not doing panels have to largely hide, not not necessarily from like listeners or fans or people, but just we have to hide in general because otherwise we'll have like these mobs that won't go away. And like, I would never, if I was out getting dinner at Oticon, I would never tweet where I was. Good God, I need time away. At PAX, I tweeted where I was all the time. I'd like tweet like, hey, we're eating dinner here. And like cool people would come and say hi. Everyone was cool. Everyone we played a game with was cool. If you played a game with us, just email me because one thing too, mm -hmm. I gave my business card out to a lot of people that I just like played one game with and hung out with. I would not give my phone number out and my direct email out mm. that liberally at any other convention. Yeah, the Noxinator showed up when we were eating dinner on uh, Sunday night. Yeah, because I tweeted out. I was like, hey, anyone cool we talked to? Saw our panels? Come say hi. And he came so say we were, hi. So we were just sort of eating a dinner at the uh, Elephant and Castle, which is pretty good, I think. And then, you know, uh, you know we're sort of going, eh, eh. Not the most exciting dinner conversation, but then our, this fan shows up, and it was totally awesome. We got someone cool to talk to for an hour about good stuff. Yeah. We actually met a decent number of fans and people out there. I, I can't give shout-outs to all of you, I, I don't even remember. There were hundreds of people that were like, oh, yeah, fuck yeah. Yep. We spent a lot of our time <laughs> hanging out with Rowan Jeremy. Yep. So in the line for the end of PAX, right, which we were cl very close to the front of that line, uh, we played Zeus on the Loose with Jeremy, and... Uh, which is an okay little silly game. You know, one aside for the, the lineup, they got these people to do like line entertainment where you could text in and like vote for memes and like, and then they'd show the meme and vote for stuff and play these games. And they generally, PAX as always, does a really good job of entertaining the line. Like yeah, because like, they know there's a line and they know waiting in line sucks. So they always just try different things to sort of entertain the people in line. What amazes me is that, you know, a long time ago, our friends Yuko and Conrad and Anand showed us Power Thirst. Bear blast! I didn't even remember Power Thirst until you showed it to me the other day. Oh, I remembered it because I always found it funny, and every now and then it's relevant to things. And just like I, I don't know, I found that meme really funny. Power Thirst run into. So I showed it to Scott randomly for some reason, and then I showed it to like Emily randomly, and then not that long later, it had this resurgence. Like at PAX, it was voted up like twice, so they kept showing it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't know why, like, Power Thirst suddenly came to the front of the meme, like, meme, meme pool. Mm -hmm. All right, so, then... They the had the beach balls, people were drawing penises on them, because the logo on the beach ball kind of looked like a penis. <laughs> it did, kind of. 
Oh, I forgot to talk about the swag bags and such, right? Oh. So and the wristbands and all that. So, like, you get your badge in the mail, right? So how do you get your swag bag or your wristband for the concert? Well, in the line in the morning, they just give them out like crazy. The swag bag had like a freaking T-shirt in it and a video game in it. Lord of the Rings Online, like it hold like the actual game was in there. Of course, it's an online game, right? So they're making their money from the subscriptions. Uh, and there was just all sorts of crazy shit in there. Uh, I managed to pick one up on Saturday because I didn't pick one up on Friday. I got my concert wristband also. Uh, you know, that's how that goes. Uh, so, yeah, the end of facts. The Omega Thon final. Dun, dun, dun. The only bad thing I have to say about PAX is every year the Omega Thon final starts crazy late. Yeah, they're really no good gotta, reason. They got to work on making it start on time. No, here's my idea on how to resolve it assume it's going to start late and schedule the start time an hour before it's actually going to start. And in front of the curtain, here's what I will do. What I would do if I can get all the stars in line. Obviously, I'm not speaking on behalf of PAX or Super Art Fight. But what if Super Art Fight just ran in front of the curtains, like in the room, before they did the Omegathon finale? I also have another idea. Uh, you should. They should have both the the semifinal and the final rounds of the Omegathon concurrently. You know, the the four, then the two, then the one, all at once. Instead of having the two rounds be separate. Uh, concurrently wouldn't work. Why not? At the same time, how do you know who won the first round? I mean, at the same time slot. Yes. You know, they would, right? So they would do the both rounds together. That way it would sort of build, you'd have the added excitement of the tournament effect. Because a lot of people don't go to every round of the Omegathon, you know? So put both of well, the final rounds together. That way it's like, woo, you know, it, it's a bigger thing rather than just, okay, play game, good, go home. You know, which is sort of what it is. Regardless, the reveal of what the final game is is always epic. And... I could have guessed it had I thought about it more, but I didn't. I'm not going to say I did when I didn't. The final game was epic as always. Fucking skee-ball. Oh, man, I got to say one thing. Excellent, excellent choice. Everybody up there sucked at skee-ball. That's true. I could have beaten all of them. That's right. Of course, Gabe always beats Tycho at Ski Ball, as always. Man, you know, Jerry talks a big talk, but he he's like, not good at video I'm games. I'm sorry, dude. You look like a little old. Like, he has all this majesty and stage presence. Like, he's big. He's larger than life when he's on stage. As soon as he went to throw that first Ski Ball, it's like he shrunk into a little old lady. Yeah. And he's like, eh. he's like, he's trying to, like, everyone, come on, let's get loud. And then he sucked. And he's like, everyone, quiet, quiet, quiet. You know, he's like, he couldn't make up his mind. And he, I don't think he tried very hard either. Man, the thing is, they, they, look, the first round told all where, you know, the one guy gets a score and the second guy realizes that all he has to do is get all 20s to beat that score. So he just got all 20s. Yep. Played super conservatively. No one went. No one got 100. I think there was like one or two 50s. <laughs> that was about it. You know, it was very bad ski ball playing by everybody. But, you know, it was kind of interesting because it was the runner up from last year against someone else. The someone else won. So the guy's been the Omegathon runner up twice in a row. So he's going to be an Omega, Omega not next year. Um, Third Omega not. Dude, if this guy, if he, I think he might have a secret strategy of like he has skills and he's going to be the runner up in the Omegathon forever. Plus, I would not want to play that dude in video games. He's probably incredibly badass. <laughs> to be like Omegathon semi, you know, non-winner, like runner-up twice in a row or three times in a row. I didn't even know anymore. That's a dangerous gamer right there. Watch the fuck out. But overall, like other than the line for the end packs was just like perfect and awesome. It was everything about it was great. Everyone we met was cool. If you met us, Email us and, you know, we'll, we'll totally respond and talk to you. Don't don't feel like we're just going to ignore you. Yep. I gave you that business card for a reason. So anything that I can remember about the packs that we did not mention I'm already. sure there's a ton of stuff left to talk about in, like, a, a brief follow-up on Thursday. Yes, there'll be many details of reviewing individual games and talking with specific interviews with people and all that sort of stuff. In the future, this episode has gone on long enough. I got to upload and yep. we'll hope the Chinese restaurant's still open. One and last thing I will point out. There was a con there was a PAX... Flu, a con SARS, as happens at cons like this. It was the it was the swine flu, apparently. Yes, it, so far Robert Koo is tweeting out and pointing out that there has been at least one straight up confirmed case of H one N one, you know, flu at PAX, and they're asking anyone who tests positive after they get home to email him with your flight numbers and all this information so they can track what's going on and probably work with the CDC. But Emily and Alex both have it. They're probably going to go get tested tomorrow to find out if they had the H1N1. Somehow, Scott and I came out unscathed, but Ro well, I was really dry and scratchy in the throat area, and I thought that was just the usual really, 
you know, dehumidifying air conditioning of staying in a convention center all day. I think we both it got sick was. and fought it off. I really think I got it and fought it off. I might have. It's tough call. Well, I was exposed to it of like several months ago, and I, I got sick, but I didn't get super Water sick. Water is poison survived it. He had it. Yeah. So... So as our friend Lisa, who is a, an expert in these sort of things, points out, you know, she's going for a doctorate and everything. She's super smart. If you get it now and it doesn't kill you, you're probably in a great position because this, might, this is the beginning of probably the second wave of it. And if, it, you know, it probably won't turn into a deadly, like crazy deadly thing. But if it does and you get it now, you have a good chance of being pretty okay when it comes through in force. Yep. So, so don't feel too bad. As long just make sure you, you know, Get treated and But don't seriously, die. if you're sick and you went to PAX and you're listening to this and you didn't go to a doctor. Go to a doctor. Go to a doctor. You might have the swine flu. And if you do have the swine flu, email Robert Koo and tell him. Yes. And tell him your flight number. Yep. All right. Shout outs again to the enforcers, to Gabe and Tycho, to everyone at PAX. It was crazy awesome. Everyone we met was awesome. Everyone seemed to love our panels. I can't remember a single non awesome part of PAX. I cannot think except of any. Except for not having breakfast and the NS guys not being there. With the possible exception of the party that I, I ran at ASEN 2002 a long time ago. And even then, that is, that is rose colored glasses. No convention has ever been better than PAX 2009 for me. No convention other than that has ever been better than PAX 2008 for me. <laughs> yep. And PAX East is coming. It was not an illusion. PAX, we remembered it being awesome. Much like Evangelion, it was awesomer than we remembered. It, either because it was awesomer this year than last year, or it's just, you know, that much more awesome. PAX is the win. Everyone else, the bar is raised. You're way under it. <sighs> and now I'm going to eat some Chinese food and go to bed. I hope I, they're still open. Good I got to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> yep. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontroadcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays, we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says Send Me an Audio on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.